Hi. Uh, welcome to Plasma 2021 um, from that's sponsored by the Department of Media Study at the University of Buffalo. Um, I'm very excited tonight. Our guest is Chris Stoltz, who is an associate curator at the Wexner Arts Center. Um, and uh, tonight uh, we'll be talking to Chris about his practice as a curator of video and film and how he came to uh, uh, start and develop his own his, uh, work and different programs uh, with artists and filmmakers over the last 14 years, that, yeah. Um, or so, yeah. Or so, okay. So last long while. Um, and uh, so we'll start, he'll give a short presentation of 20 minutes um, about uh, his history and a lot about the Wexner Arts Center. And then, um, and then after about 20 minutes or so, uh, Chris and I will uh, get into a, a conversation specifically about Cinetrack. So we'll spend about 20 minutes where um, I have uh, a number of questions for Chris. So it'll be a dialogue between the two of us. And then we'll open it up for questions from students and from uh, the audience. Um, and again, for people who are just joining us, please feel free to uh, put questions in the chat. And um, uh, Cortland Bird, who is the teaching assistant for this class, will be monitoring the chat, um, both for technical and for um, uh, uh, to gather your questions. Um, so if you don't feel like raising your hand after the Q&A, um, during the Q&A, feel free to um, put your questions in the chat. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna read a short bio of Chris Stoltz. Um, uh, Chris Stoltz has been an associate curator at the Wexner Center for Arts Film Video Department since 2002, uh, planning visits and events with filmmakers such as Joe Dante, Yance Ford, Chris Kirsten Johnson, Kelly Reichart, um, Happy Chapong, Wirasakal, which I can never, you'll have to do that for us, Chris. Um, he has organized hundreds of screenings, festivals, and retrospectives with a focus on documentary and experimental film. In 2012, he curated the touring uh, series Cruzamentos, Contemporary Brazilian Documentary, the largest North American film survey on the topic. And along with Genevieve Yu, he co-curated the 2016 Flaherty New York City series, Wild Sounds exploring films about gender and voice. His writing has appeared in Art Forum, Cinemascope, Film Comment, and the um, Viennale catalog, among others. Uh, tonight, he is also part of the curatorial team that commissioned uh, a web-based film project called Cinetrax 20. Um, we'll put the link to it in the chat for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, it's a collection of two minute films um, that were made by a series of, of filmmakers um, and uh, premiered in October online from the Wexner. Um, and so we'll spend the, the second half of the presentation talking specifically about that project. Um, so without any more introduction, I give you Chris Stoltz. Thanks, Paige. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's a, it's a great series and a great history. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it. We're having a, a hailstorm, ice storm, blizzard right now. I just got a text um, about 30 seconds ago from the Ohio State University where I work um, that classes are canceled for tonight and tomorrow and the university almost never does that. So if my power goes out during this, if like lines start going down, thank you, it was really fun to be here. Um, but hopefully we'll make it through this whole time. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. So this is a photo of the Wexner Center for the Arts, which is a, a some people say it's the first postmodern post piece of architecture in the United States. It opened in 1989, um, designed by the architect Peter Eisenman. 
And there used to be an armory at Ohio State on this exact location. So you can see signs of um, the, the, the buildings past or the site past, um, but kind of exploded into um, a fragmented um, sort of coherent whole. And you see the lattice work on the right there. And that's kind of a nod to this idea of the Wexner Center being an institute of contemporary art. So this idea of never quite being finished. And I think one of the, the primary missions of the Wexner Center is to support the creation of new work. And I'm actually from Columbus, Ohio and started going to the Wexner Center um, when I was an undergrad in 1989 and I started classes the very quarter that the Wexner Center opened and the first paper I ever wrote at Ohio State was on the opening exhibition at uh, the Wexner Center, which was John Cage and a bunch of other artists. And I'm sure um, your professors won't like me to say this, but I feel like I learned more going to events at the Wexner Center than I did in a lot of my classes. Um, the center is meant to be very multidisciplinary. So there's an exhibitions program, there's a performing arts program, and there's the film video program. And it's interesting how much overlap there can be between all those. So I just suddenly um, found myself immersed in, in the world that the Wexner Center was presenting with visiting artists like uh, the choreographer and filmmaker Yvonne Rayner or the director Martin Scorsese, um, the theater director Peter Brook, Robert Rauschenberg. It was just, it was overwhelming. And I, uh, I it was, it was life-changing in every way. I think there's almost no way I would still be in Columbus if it weren't for the Wexner Center. Um, I realized how special of a place it was and feel very fortunate that, um, you know, when I was going to undergrad classes, I had no idea that um, there was a job that people did where they let you pick out movies to show and show them to people <laughs> and then they call it a curator. Um, so yeah, I feel very fortunate to be here, but also um, I feel very fortunate that it's such an artist centric institution and one of the things that's so exciting to me is my main interest is, is film um, and its offshoots and its histories. But at the center, it's possible to have all these overlaps between artists and uh, filmmakers or choreographers and collaborations that can come out of that. Um, it's almost embedded in the DNA of the Wexter Center because <clears throat> there's a story, it was before I was, um, working there, but um, at the opening night event, um, backstage was the first time the singer Laurie Anderson ever met the um, avant-garde classical music quartet, the Kronos Quartet. And they then became collaborators for decades after we later commissioned a piece from them. Um, so it is kind of these chance encounters that our institution makes possible that um, is one of the things that's most nourishing for me. So this was an event like in 96 that I remember being so exciting to me. The filmmaker Todd Haynes, um, one of the best filmmakers of the 90s and still continues to be so exciting. And he's talking with the visual artist, Barbara Kruger. And it was just the kind of conversation that um, I'd never seen anywhere else. And it happens, but it, it's still rare. And so to help facilitate things like that is, is a constant joy. Um, my other continued support source of delight um, about working at the Wexner Center is that we have a post-production studio. Um, so we've had hundreds of artists come um, and the strength of the program is how how flexible it is. There's one of our editors, Michael Linick, and we have two full-time editors. They work with filmmakers who are working on everything from multi-channel installation to documentary to narrative, experimental films. Um, it's, I can't imagine how they do their job because one week they might be working on 
a documentary about um, immigrants in Berkeley trying to get health care, and then the next week work on a completely abstract animation, these crazy gear shifts that they have to do. Um, but a lot of really great filmmakers that have come through, including Greg Bordowitz, who um, is giving the closing plasma lecture. Greg shot an entire narrative feature film um, in the studio at the Wexner Center. He's the only filmmaker to have made a feature <laughs> on set production and everything. Um, so it's, it's just great to have working artists constantly coming through and us able to support them. We have an apartment where they can come and stay. They just have to pay their way to get here. Um, and then we take, they have access to our studio 24 hours a day and our editors during business hours. Um, and just as a curator being in Columbus, Ohio, you can feel very um, out of the loop just in terms of that, like if you were in New York or somewhere where you're just day to day immersed in the gossip or what projects people are working on, we almost always have one to two artists there in residence at the Wexner Center. So I can do studio visits um, in Columbus, Ohio with amazing artists. So that's such an incredible resource and so sustaining. But we also um, give out residency awards. Once a year, we're able to give money to artists. So I thought I would focus on um, a couple projects in depth um, from the past 20 years that have been um, pretty exciting to see how we've been able to influence artists' careers. Um, oh, well, this um, Barbara Hammer, one of the most pioneering lesbian experimental filmmakers who, who died just a couple of years ago, her final project was this installation, this really immersive, gorgeous installation called Evidentiary Bodies. And we'd had a long relationship with Barbara and she'd come and made four or five films. Every once in a while when she wasn't able to get money for something, she would just send us um, boxes of tapes for us to just digitize her archive and her unused footage. And she came to us and she really, we, we knew she was in this archival retrospective phase of her life. She, she had a terminal disease and knew her time was short and had a couple things she wanted to accomplish. And she had the force of will like nobody I've ever met. She was just such an amazing life force even in, even in her final, final years. And so she wanted to work on this installation, but wasn't able to come to the Wexner Center for a residency. So for the first time in our history, we sent one of our editors, Paul Hill, to New York, and he, we did Barbara's residency in her studio on the Upper West Side. And Paul was immersed in her life for a week, and it was really her, her final project. And we did everything we could to make it happen. And Barbara was such a, she wanted to experience everything every which way. So they would work on the project. Um, like, why don't we watch the footage lying on the floor and see how that feels. And think of every way you could possibly present this footage or think it through. Um, it wasn't a project I was particularly um, involved with, um, but, it's still just in terms of the institution. Um, I think it was so, everybody did everything we could for Barbara to, to make this um, into a reality. Um, another filmmaker we had, we've had a long relationship with is Kelly Reichert, who I think is one of the most exciting um, independent filmmakers working right now. Her film last year, First Cow was, um, I think one of the best films of the year. And Kelly came um, at a moment when um, she had made one feature film in 94, River of Grass, which um, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival about the same time that like Kevin Smith and um, Richard Linklater and all sorts of dudes were showing their work for the first time. And they went on to have 
amazing careers, but nobody would support Kelly for a second film. Um, so she went off and made little like super eight short films and wasn't really satisfied with that. So she came to the Wexner Center for a residency a decade after making River of Grass in 2004 and made this little experimental film called Travis. And she's not happy with it at all. She doesn't like it to be shown. She doesn't like people to see it. She thinks of it as a complete failure, but she still remains so grateful to the Wexner Center because we gave her this space to realize she's not an experimental filmmaker. She wants to be doing narrative. She wants to get back into that world and like quit fooling around with all these other potential lives she could be living. So after that, she went back to have this amazing run of independent films that um, I think are landmarks. And then we stayed in touch over the years. And when we were coming up for our next residency award to give, to give I think that year we had $50,000 to give to a filmmaker. And we were just talking with folks to see what they were working on and who, who we could support in the most um, beneficial way. So she was starting to work on this film that became Certain Women. And actually when I called her, it was the day after she was completely demoralized because she was going to have to, for budget reasons, shoot it on video. And she and her cinematographer the day before had gone out and done some tests with the video camera to see how the footage looked and they're shooting in Montana and just like the snowy fields and terrains just showed up as a block of white on the video screen. And Kelly's somebody who grew up shooting in 16 millimeter, that's like in her lifeblood. And she was really heartbroken about this compromise they were gonna have to do to shoot on um, video. And even without consulting with my, my coworkers, <laughs> we basically committed to Kelly that we could give you the money that would allow you to shoot this on film with the residency award. And she did, and you might be able to tell from this photo that the grain and that image is so crucial to capturing what she wanted to. Um, so it was just kind of this amazing moment of calling an artist at the exact right moment to be able to, to change you know, the metabolism of the film basically. Usually with residency awards, we build in um, that the artist has to come to Columbus and, you know, there's some sort of involvement that's a little more reciprocal, um, but Kelly was about to start shooting this film, so that wasn't really possible. Um, so, you no, know, we just ended up doing some workshops and class visits and all sorts of events with her once the film was done, which was also exciting because we were one of the first venues to be able to show the film. Um, and an upcoming, well, the current um, residency award project we're working on right now is with uh, Indigenous Collective New Red Order. And I know Adam Khalil is coming later in the plasma season to give a lecture. And his work is so exciting. We're just in the early stages of talking with them. And they kind of embody um, what the Wexner Center is about with a very multidisciplinary approach that incorporates performance, um, films, installations, and our project with them can go in so many directions. And also just what they do coming to Columbus, Ohio, where all the statues of Christopher Columbus are coming down right now. Um, I'm hoping we can get into all sorts of trouble with them. Um, most of what I do though is showing films in the theater. Um, and trying to bring as many filmmakers as we can to Columbus for our audience to engage with. Um, and that takes up almost all of my time. And most of it is pretty unglamorous work. You're just booking a film to show on a Tuesday night and it, you know, it's something you're excited about, but it's, it's administrative work or making sure the film prints arrive on time. So we actually have something to show or that it goes out to the next venue on time because in this field, the worst thing you can have is bad karma from making the next venue miss their screening. Um, 
So that's the bulk of what I do. And I feel a little dishonest um, giving this presentation talking about like the really fun engaged projects when most of it is kind of grunt work. Um, I'll try to speed up through the rest of this. Um, so briefly in January 2007, I was working on this program that was going to be a screening of experimental films that took their footage from video game because there were kind of it was starting to become a bit in the air, but nobody had really looked at it closely. Um, and we had a series of screenings and an installation of a video game by Corey Archangel, who I believe is a Buffalo native. Um, and we had Corey come out and in our screening, we, we actually, I think we're the only place that has ever shown Corey's um, piece Super Mario movie in a cinema. He hacked a Nintendo 64 game and turned it along with the uh, the Pittsburgh collective paper rad, and they turned it into a movie about Super Mario's adventure through the cloud world and super psychedelic, amazing. But he'd only shown it in galleries, and the artwork is a video game cartridge. And Corey didn't want it to play like a film, so at the end of the screening, after we'd shown all the other films, we had a Nintendo 64 on the stage in front of the theater, in front of the screen, and. Corey walked up and just put the cartridge in the Nintendo 64 and the movie started playing and it was, it was a beautiful moment. Um, but I'll try to be a bit more succinct. There was one film in that program by um, an old school experimental filmmaker, Phil Solomon, who's kind of an heir to Stan Brackage. And Phil made this little, kind of little found footage film out of this game, San Andreas, or Grand Theft Auto San Andreas which at the time was a notoriously violent video game. And he had a friend who was diagnosed with a terminal illness. And so they made this, he made this work as a little uh, get well soon card. And I'd seen it and wanted to include it in the program. And Phil, whose work is really known for the qualities of 16 millimeter film um, that he's able to bring out through optical printing and it was just odd to see him, of all people, transitioning to digital video game based work. But he said, I, I've been like playing around with this game more and feel like there's something substantial here. And I could try to make something, finish something in time for your program. So he sent me this, this new piece, Rehearsals for Retirement. Um, and it arrived via FedEx the day before the program. Um, and we weren't even sure. He's like, if you don't want to include it in the program, it's fine. I'll understand. And watching that on my own with no expectations in a theater, um, being the first viewer of it is still one of the most powerful moments I've ever had in a theater. It's this really mournful elegy um, built through this super violent video game that's just so attuned to texture and so Phil and I really started to, to talk through and this film, how it could live in the world. And it really opened up a new phase of his career for his final years. Um, and it, Phil died a couple of years ago. He had a lung disease that was first starting to emerge. So he would call this movie making for invalids because <laughs> he couldn't go out in the world and shoot. So he was able to use this video game to make footage. And we have this sustained relationship that I, I could talk for 15, 20 minutes about how we worked on this piece, Empire, which was a remake of um, Andy Warhol's Empire within Grand Theft Auto 4. And we set it up as an installation. Um, and I basically had to be the cinematographer for it. And it involved like using cheat codes and hijacking a helicopter, jumping off the roof of a building, spawning a motorcycle to appear so you could get on it and like set up the shot. And But for the interest of time, I'll keep moving um, onto a project that has, has been my favorite thing to work on over the past few years. Um, Unorthodox is, I, I call it a curated film festival. It exists somewhere between a film series and a festival but it's devoted to creative nonfiction filmmaking. Um, I don't even like to use doc, the word documentary. Um, 
even though that's kind of embedded in the name of the, the festival. Um, and we, uh, we show about four or five days worth of films and on weekends just kind of sun up to sundown screenings, invite as many of the filmmakers as we can to come out for it. We've done it four years now and it's, it's become so meaningful, I think, to both audiences and filmmakers. Filmmakers love it um, because at a festival, I don't know how many of you have gone to like big film festivals, but there is usually like seven films playing at every given moment on seven different screens and everybody's so scattered and has their own itineraries. I think of this more as a bus where people are getting on and off the same stops and kind of traveling together. And so the filmmakers are watching the same things along with the audience and the filmmakers start to, to merge into this like little community that forms over the course of the long weekend. Um, there's filmmakers who have existed in the field for decades and never met each other. Um, Leela Weinrob had been shooting since the 90s um, footage of primarily black lesbian strip clubs in LA and doc being like the house videographer. And Yancey Ford, um, his film Strong Island, he was the first trans director ever nominated for an Oscar for that film. And Yancey had been the producer for PBS's series POV about as establishment as you can get in the documentary world but yet his film is so adventurous and radical and strong. And their films just showed in different types of festivals. <laughs> um, and so this is a place where different worlds can interact and folks who should have met each other decades ago meet for the first time. And, you know, it was amazing, like the bond they had instantly. And, filmmakers really get to know audience members over the course of the weekend. And, and it really does form a, a sense of community. Um, we always build into it master classes um, from the filmmakers that are both super technical and super accessible. So Steve Riker and Julia Bognar live right down the freeway from us um, in, in Dayton and teach at Wright State. And they just won the Oscar last year for their documentary American Factory. Um, so they're, Great to have. We build in class visits, um, installations, you know, just a constant string. So this year we had to do it virtually, but it really allowed us to curate conversations and bring in people in conversation that we wouldn't have been able to brought, you know, in person all at the same time. Um, so it was disappointing to have to do it online, but it allowed for other things that could happen. And then these conversations live online after the fact and can be a resource um, after the festival is over. And so to segue here, um, in 2019 at Unorthodox, we brought in a filmmaker, Rosine Mbakum, who she's from Cameroon, but she lives in Belgium now. Um, and she was one of my favorite filmmakers we've ever brought in, just the most amazing person. It's a long story, but the, the famous director, Mike Lee, happened to be in Columbus then, and he came to all the unorthodox screenings, and there were these amazing encounters between the, the documentary filmmakers and Mike Lee, who's won the Palme d'Or at Cannes, and it was so cool, but meeting Rosine, I knew she was one of those artists that we needed to have a sustained relationship with. And we'd been talking about commissioning work and doing a commissioning project. So Rosine was one of the first filmmakers whose name came up when we started talking about Cinetrax. And I think we can segue <laughs> from that into talking about Cinetrax. Sorry, that went so long. No, that was great. That was great. Um, so like, yeah, let's start. So tell me, so why don't you start with where, how that project developed um, in the context of uh, this artist-centered uh, um, Wexner Center kind of history of uh, engaging and commissioning work. Um, yeah, there's this, there's this curator that was at the Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, Sally Dixon in the 70s and 80s. And 
she would bring filmmakers to Pittsburgh, like Stan Brackage and Hollis Frampton and commission works. And it was some of those artists defining works um, that were made. And I've always been inspired by those relationships that Sally was able to have with the filmmakers. And so we always knew myself and my colleagues, Dave Philippi and Jennifer Lang, we've just been talking about a curating project and in the installation space that we have between the galleries and the cinema, um, my colleague Dave had just shown the Cinetrack, the 1968 Cinetracks. And we kept saying like, oh, we should do something like the Cinetracks. <laughs> you know, like come up with parameters. And we just kept saying like the Cinetracks so much. And it's like, well, why don't we just do a, a updated tweak on the Cinetrax. And that was kind of the spark where we kind of understood what this could or needed to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so w when did it start? When did you come up with the plan? And because it started actually before COVID, right? You started in okay. 20, when was the first idea? And then can you talk a little bit about the different, how you came to invite the, the different filmmakers. So you said Rosine was on your mind, a, a person that you definitely wanted to work with. And then this came and, you know, a project appeared that you guys had already been thinking about. So she was perfect for it. But how about the other ones? And yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's, we started talking about commissions in 2018. And then at some point in 2019, we came up with the Cinetrax idea. And knew that the two big like curatorial interventions on our part, we wanted to like really just open it up to the filmmakers so they could take it in whatever directions they wanted to go and kind of stay out of that unless, you know, folks wanted the back and forth. So we knew that um, 2020 was going to be a big year in terms of you know, the election in the United States, but also globally. Um, so that, we wanted to time it to fall of 2020. Um, and like it says in the opening crawl, like what 2020 ended up becoming changed so much from what we thought it would be in 2019. But the two big um, gestures that we had to do as curators were come up with the rules that each filmmaker would have to, to comply with. Um, and yeah. my thinking um, in this was that the 1968 Cinetracks, which I think a number of you have seen, the rules were very restrictive and they all were made by French white men for the most part. Um, and they were all about very, you know, a specific moment in time, a specific place, and people coming from a pretty similar ideology. And that just didn't seem viable for 2020. So we knew we wanted to broaden it in every way we could think of. We wanted to make the rules much broader so that filmmakers could take it in all sorts of directions we would never anticipate. Um, we wanted to broaden the pool of people contributing um, in every way from age to geography, to race, to gender. Um, and so, yeah, that, um, that sense of the rules um, was one of the most exciting things to see. And almost every filmmaker breaks at least one of the rules. And as a viewer, hopefully that's one of the fun things while watching it. You're like, well, that person didn't actually do that. And we didn't actually care if everybody followed every rule to the letter. It was a prompt for them. And ways that filmmakers upended that was really exciting to see because we were thinking, you know, a specific day and there's some filmmakers who are going to fool around with that and maybe incorporate found footage and things, but it's kind of amazing to see how many filmmakers resisted this idea of like a, 
a linear sense of time or being able to extract one moment in time from the history of time. And maybe this is a little me editorializing, but um, it was more of the indigenous or non-Western filmmakers who really did that. They wanted to contextualize this moment and a long history of moments. And it was really exciting when those entries started to come in and reveal things we hadn't even thought about um, coming up with, with the parameters. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me because I think uh, Peter Kabelka defines uh, a film as idea meets impediment <laughs> is, uh, you know, results in a film. Yeah. And so it was, you know, uh, rules meet, you know, the ideas and materials and thinking, right, produced these and that it was kind of that negotiation. Yeah, so let's talk, um, so I guess one of the questions that I, uh, it was, was it originally going to be an online commission? Um, like, was it gonna be an online um, uh, exhibition? Or did that emerge because of uh, um, COVID? A little of both. Um... I think we knew the ultimate goal was that it would end up online, but we thought we would have a premiere at the Wexner Center, you know, maybe a panel with some of the filmmakers, um, and then a tour of theatrical venues um, after our premiere, and then kind of, you know, hopefully after it had had some sort of life in theaters, um, you know, mainly museums and cinematechs. Um, then we would put it up online. So that was like an end point. Um, it was kind of amazing that it still ended up de did having like a little bit of a tour, um, even just online, like Union Docs did a screening of it. And then we, we invited, I think seven or eight filmmakers came for a Q&A after that and UCLA presented it, Harvard, MFA Houston. So it did, go to different cities online <laughs> in a way. Um, so it, it sort of happened in a odd way. Yeah. But it also allowed us to create all the um, contextual material and interviews and conversations that could go online with this. Um, so that was nice to be able to package it um, and contextualize it a little in ways we wouldn't have probably been able to do in a cinema. Yeah, but it's also interesting that it you it did end up kind of or continues to have this moment, right? These events um, where people are watching together online or having a conversation online. One yeah, of the um, at Cal Arts last week, Arena Lanbacher um, just did something similar as this with her class and built it into her class. So it's it's been a great resource, I think, for people teaching film too to build it into their curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. Especially given that we're, we're all in this context now of having, right, of teaching online and watching online, but then being able to kind of come at these focal points, right, at, at moments in time. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I realized I didn't answer your, another part of your question, but fi figuring out the filmmakers, I think it's probably clear that one of the through lines is it's primarily folks who exist in an experimental or documentary world. We felt like they would work in this mode or adapt to it most naturally. Um, Charles Burnett is primarily a narrative feature filmmaker, fiction filmmaker. Um, and it's kind of interesting and exciting to try to, to see him try to make a two minute narrative film I think most people respond to it well, but he's really unsatisfied with it and feels like you need more than two minutes to, to do a narrative. Um, so that was like kind of one of the things in the forefront of our mind, because that's where so many projects like this go wrong is you pick filmmakers who just aren't going to work in this mode very well. <laughs> yeah. So so let's talk about, because you worked with um, uh, eight of them um, uh, specifically, and we can talk. So there's material, just for people who don't know, there's material online of, 
that are conversations with all most of the filmmakers in some capacity. Um, but Chris worked with eight in particular, and I thought we could focus on them. There are uh, two interviews online um, with two of them. Um, and then uh, there's a short piece, an artist piece um, in relationship to another one of them. But I thought we could just start with when you're talking about experimental um, filmmakers, I think starting with Cameron Granger, and that's someone that you worked with, and it's the opening film, right? It's the opening video. You wanna talk a little bit about that and uh, how you came to ask them and uh, work with them? Yeah, um, Cameron, it says here Manhattan, because that's where he made this film, because um, that's, he had, a, he had a residency in New York um, when COVID hit, so he was kind of stuck there. But Cameron's from Columbus um, and is an artist that has been making exciting work that's gotten a lot of attention locally and has a, had a strong relationship um, with the Wexner Center and like taught video making workshops or helped in our education department and um, I had, there was, nobody said no when we asked them to participate in this, but there is one filmmaker that I had invited that just never responded. And so I was starting to think of who else I could invite instead. And I went to a, a opening of Cameron's at the Columbus Museum of Art where he had this amazing installation where he had school, like middle school um, desks, like those, those boards um, that you use at your desk. He had those up on the screen or up on the wall and was projecting video on about 20 of those and scenes from Do the Right Thing, House Party, all sorts of um, mainly black films from the 90s. Um, tying in education and like, I don't know, Hollywood films providing some other sort of edu It was a really exciting installation. And at, at the opening, I just, it clicked for me. Like we have this slot that we need to fill for unorthodox and Cameron, he's ready to be known outside of Columbus. Um, and I think curatorially, as we were starting to figure out the sequence of the programs, we knew Cameron's had to go first and we were really excited to situate Columbus. This is all footage of um, one of the two Christopher Columbus statues in Columbus coming down there. So he incorporated, even though he was locked up in Manhattan, he was still able to have footage that his friends were sending him from Columbus or posting on social media. Um, and yeah, we wanted to really have very established artists, emerging artists, and Cam has gotten so much attention um, from this outside of Columbus. And um, yeah, it, it was, he was ready for it and it was the right time. And he made a really strong piece that um, kind of became a defining piece for the project. I mean, it's the curtain raiser. It, it states a lot of, but yeah, it's a great 2020 film. Yeah. It's in that summer we, we all had with lockdowns and the conflicts between those. And yeah. 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 And it also is in, you know, it, it falls in the category of desktop documentary, mm -hmm. right? It's, mm -hmm. It begins with, uh, I mean, this is just one of the shots. Um, from it, but it is working for starts, the framing of it starts with the desktop. Mm -hmm. And so it really does set the stage for this being a, a film, you know, a, a collection of films that is being negotiated through screens, right? right. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just say one last thing, or what we can talk about Cam all night, <laughs> I'd love to. But he was the artist that I probably had more back and forth with than anybody else because he was just not in a place to be making work in headspace. He he didn't want, I mean, it, it shows in the piece, he didn't want to be visible in certain ways. And, and he wanted to do things that were of direct aid to his people. 
<laughs> this community and artwork felt indulgent. And then eventually he got to a place, he thought he was really late. He was like past the deadline by a week. For most people, we extended the deadline by months because it was supposed to be in June of 2020. And yeah, I mean, just, you know, all the protests against police brutality and racial justice and nobody was, and yeah, Cameron just couldn't even think about making work. And eventually, like I think around August, he made this and as we've talked about it, he's moved back to Columbus and he was really happy to have this prompt and this commission because otherwise he wouldn't have made anything during this time. And he says he has this to look back on as a, as a record from where he was during this summer. And yeah, he, he has a show that just opened up in Columbus um, last week. And I think this kind of got him, you know, back on his, his feet to, we also worked with him, um, I think two months ago, we did a project in our galleries that we, we asked him to be involved with. And he curated a video program, but then he also, um, he and I and some other colleagues all went together, bought, we used the budget that he had for the exhibition to buy food that we made some prepared meals and made um, food kits with recipes, like Cameron made a zine with recipes in them. And so one rainy Saturday, we split up and went to two different spots in Columbus, one public library, one a park, and just distributed food to um, people with food insecurity across Columbus. So I think Cam really found this way to navigate like his art making practice and um, community work. Right. And to some degree that really speaks to the, the political urgency that was behind Cinetrack 68, right? Mm -hmm. That was, they were meant to shoot those films, right? And then process them, turn them around and then screen them, mm -hmm. right? To feed and support the, the struggles on the streets in Paris, mm -hmm. 68. Um, so really interesting, but so perfect segue into though then the next piece that one of the people that you worked with, which was Colleen Smith, mm -hmm. right? And she you said to me that she too was in that place of it was hard to make work. And um, uh, you want to talk a little bit about working with Colleen on the piece? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. My colleague Jennifer and I like both kind of work with Colleen and. She was the very last filmmaker to turn something in. And, and I think every time Colleen felt like she had the equilibrium to think about making work, something else, she, she lost a number of people to COVID. Um, and I think at the very last minute, she thought of this piece that she could make a tribute that just tied into her, her themes of love and generosity for the black community, all the people she's thought of that she's lost over the past however many months and just the lack of acknowledgement to what everybody was going through. And so she made this this lovely, like, colorful um, memorial. I, I don't know, I think it's such a moving piece um, and such a, a stinger at the end. We, one funny thing about this one is Colleen, like I said, was the last one to come in and we were so excited that there were no Trump references in all of Cinetrax. And then Colleen comes in at the last minute and Trump's voice appears. <laughs> and we were, I think it works really well because it's such a stinging barb and rebuke. And we were worried it was just gonna be wall to wall. Like, I don't know, who's gonna wanna watch all these like Trump takedown films? And it didn't end up being that. Yeah. 
And yeah, I don't know. It kind of makes sense that that appears here at the end with, with Colleen's piece. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the, uh, not to, the spoiler of the film is that, right, the, the title is, right, Flowers for Virtually Nobody. And uh, Clump's line is that, you know, virtually nobody, right, is uh, dying of COVID. Yeah. And so uh, it's the answer to that, right? That these are the flowers for virtually nobody. Um, it's really beautiful and the colors are just stunning. Yeah. yeah. And we've yeah. been excited to see how these films will live on their own outside of Cinetrax, like if filmmakers will include them in screenings of their, and so not long after making this, um, I think Colleen was really happy to have made it because um, there was some media arts project happening in London and at Piccadilly Square, they have some big kind of like Times Square, some big screen and they were showing artworks on it. And they asked Colleen if she had anything new they could show at Piccadilly Square. So Colleen ended up showing this um, at Piccadilly Square in London. So, yeah. Yeah, and no, that's great. Like that's exactly, right, this, the capacity, the capability, right, that's now possible with this um, framework to think about this going from this, uh, you know, the place of production, right, of being alone and in this isolated situation. And then the, this film now being able to travel and be in public space, mm -hmm. right, is really amazing. Um, so then the next one is Rosine's. So do you want to talk about this a little bit? Um, yeah, I'll try to be more economical. <laughs> um, yeah, Rosine, like I said, we'd invited her. And when we had invited her for Unorthodox, it was pretty great because um, that film Chez Jolie Coiffour was picked up by a, a documentary distributor, Icarus Films, and they were going, they had planned a release for it. And we had a very specific time when we were going to be doing our screening. So we invited Colleen to come and they tied the national release of the film to Colleen or to, to Rosine being in the country and set up a national tour for her. And the New Yorker wrote a rave about her being like one of the most exciting voices in documentary. And so it really launched her in the US. She hadn't been known and I've seen a preview of her next film and it's clear that her project is just listening and providing um, testimonials for African women and often you know, um, people living very much on the margins. Her next film is just kind of a interview, not even interview, it's straight conversations, monologues from a, a sex worker um, that has become a good friend of hers. And just this viewpoint that is, is a real blind spot in cinema history. And so Colleen had planned to go back to Cameroon and film her mom and was still able to incorporate her into the film. And it was like a week before she was going to go on her trip that Belgium locked down. And so she was just heartbroken, um, you know, about not being to go home and she had her whole film planned out and it really morphed into this. And since making this um, portrait of, of African healthcare workers on the front lines in Belgium and how that's represented in larger society, um, Rosine is still planning to continue to work on this as her, her next feature after this. So um, mm. it's kind of great to give that seed for what will hopefully become an even more expanded look. There's, I don't, while it's on my mind, I'll say, I think the smartest decision we made in coming up with the rules for this was saying that the films needed to be two minutes. Because I remember at one moment we were like, what about three minutes? That'll give people a bigger canvas. And But as they started coming in, I think one of the strengths of this is it's so succinct. It's moving on to something else very quickly. You're just, and like you can present an idea pretty well in two minutes if you know what you're doing. I think if you give most filmmaker, most of these filmmakers three minutes, it's just gonna spin its wheels a little longer. And 
there'll be more dead space in some of them. And, but Rosine is the one where like, I'm amazed at how many ideas she can get. And you watch it, it doesn't happen. It's not a fast film. It happens at a, at a, a leisurely, maybe not leisurely, but like at a, a moderate pace. She's one like, I would have loved to have seen what she could do in three minutes. <laughs> but she'll make a feature film on this. So yeah, that's even better. Yeah. Um, part of the, just to give some context for the film is about the, the healthcare workers in Belgium who are primarily um, uh, Congolese, right? That they're immigrants and that the kind of what that, how the history of colonialism and COVID meet um, and how there's no coverage of it, right? That there's these are a kind of, so what she does in the end of the film is show us images from the colonial history, contrasting it with these um, images of some of the healthcare workers, right? Who are really- um, uh, when, when Belgian media is, is portraying the healthcare industry on you know, commercials or things, it's all so whitewashed. And yeah, none of, none of the actual majority of the frontline workers are, are visible or acknowledged. Um, yeah, and how it ties into colonial history, yeah. yeah. And of imaging of colonial history too, right? It's mm -hmm. so conscious of the, the significance and importance of the um, photographs, right? Mm -hmm. and, and showing and circulating the photographs um, virtually, right? Mm -hmm. she, um, you have that sense that this is all produced through at a distance, right? Mm -hmm. Through the computer. Um, uh, but maybe this is Both a good time. are so smart and exciting and I'd encourage everybody to, to check them out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I can't wait to see a full length from this one. It's really, uh, yeah. So I was, but I want to jump to Caravan um, mm -hmm. Collective because it actually kind of intersects really well. Um, so you want to talk about working with them and that film, um, and I'll find the slide. It'll take me a minute. Yeah, um, yeah. So Karabing is an indigenous collective in Australia um, with one member who's an American um, who kind of does most of the interfacing with the art world, um, but it is very much a collective. And we had actually, through the studio, helped support their very first film um, and showed it in our installation space. And I wrote about it back then and have always um, admired their work so much from afar. And one of the American member, Elizabeth Povinelli, writes a lot about um, ethnography and, you know, issues of ethnographic film and as a discipline. Um, and her work is so inspiring. So they were one of the very first folks I reached out to as well. And Elizabeth, I think of all the people we reached out to, she was the most familiar with the 68 Cine Tracks. Oh, wow. And instantly said, I love this concept. I want to bring this forward. I want to bring this to the present. And there's ways where it does tie into Sinatrax history with, you know, so much text. And she was very conscious of the, uh, the previous iteration and those rules. And, but she also said, I can't really write right now. We're in the midst of bushwhacking a new trail to the beach that Carabang has always dreamt of doing. And we don't really have Wi-Fi, you know, we don't really have, there's one spot where we have internet reception and I'm sitting on top of a Jeep writing to you right now <laughs> to send this through, but yes, we're in. And she, so she later said that then they started filming that, that bushwhacking trip right then. Um, so we rock, got them at just the right moment when they were in the midst of this like event that the collective has been wanting to do for years. And Elizabeth was telling them the rest of the collective all about the 68 Cinetracks and 
getting them excited about it. And, you know, again, COVID um, ties into this. So the project mutated and as well as Rosine, they really tie, um, you know, this current COVID moment um, into colonialist history. And um, again, with kind of a stinger of an ending that they've been like outsmarting these things for years. <laughs> and the the colonialists that like you know keep getting tricked up and their their kind of trickster <laughs> mentality tying in with ancestors and that was like a different source of wisdom to tap to respond to these moments and um they I don't think they get enough credit for how crafted their videos are um, in terms of technique and just a general approach because they sent more iterations of their film than anybody else. So I kind of saw this initially as pretty straight documentary footage and then all these layers of intervention that they start adding with you know, two different um, sources of text and then pausing and stopping and slowing down the video and heightening senses of time, contracting, expanding time within two minutes. I, it, it's virtuosic in the sound. Um, and it's one that really rewards multiple viewings. Um, just how they're making two minutes. I, I, I think one of the things with this project too is you get a sense of, all the different ways that two minutes can pass. Mm. <laughs> How you can make two minutes feel so different temporally. Um, mm -hmm. And they they key into that in some I don't know, pretty staggering ways. Yeah, yeah. And also then they make this point about lasting, right? Of this mm -hmm. different kind of both history and then the longevity, right? Mm -hmm. Against uh, in the face of uh, encroachment, in the face of, uh, you know, health, um, the disparities in um, healthcare and, uh, right, um, pre-existing conditions, right, amongst, um, uh, right. So I think, um, yeah, thanks for actually getting to what the works are. I'm talking around them and you're good at <laughs> talking about the actual. And then, so let's go to last one just before we go back. I mean, and we can talk about Jolnik too, but this one I wanted to go to just because um, A, the reading, you know, that this is so different. You said to me that this is one of the people that you worked with and this, her film was, uh, you know, when people talk about it and after watching it often, this is the one that stands out as so different. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, Akweke, their film kind of came about, um, especially during the Trump administration, I've really fallen back in love with reading. And that's one of the primary ways I've, I've stayed somewhat sane in the past four years is reading so much. And I've been trying to think of ways to, the Wexner Center is so multidisciplinary, but we don't often interact with authors a lot. So I've been trying to think of ways to bring authors in dialogue with other art forms. And I'd read Akweke's book, Freshwater, which just is so radical and like nothing else, like few other things in contemporary literature, um, so powerful. And I found out almost accidentally in finding out more about them, they, they have a, a small practice as a video artist, mainly when they were in school. And so I just wrote to Akweke, who is really blowing up in, in the book world and their new book, The Death of Vivek Oji um, is, I think one of the best books of last year and has put them on an even higher scale. One of the biggest publishers in the country put it out. Um, and so I, I didn't really expect much of a response when I sent out this uh, commission invitation. But I think Akweke, it was just one of those things where 
they're just seen as one way now as an author and invited to do those things. And this is another like really important part of their identity and practice, but never get requested to, to make work in that way. And they're um, very much coming out of the video art world rather than the film world. So the film has, the video has more of that feel. Um, and it, it yeah, it, I guess it can feel a little out of place with the others. Um, I like that intervention and disruption that they create. And again, it's tying it into um, other very non-Western um, histories, traditions, things that might not be immediately legible to Western viewers like Igbo rituals. Um, and yeah, also asked Akweke to write an artist statement to accompany this. And it's just a beautiful piece of writing. So in addition to um, a new video work, it was exciting to have like a small piece of writing by them um, as a part of this. Um, and yeah, it kind of breaks out of any, any binaries or constrictions um, that you could apply to the, a project or, or anything. Um, yeah, they did their own thing. And I think the project is so much the better for it. Yeah. Um, I guess the, uh, one of the things that, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, we talked, you, you brought up a little bit and uh, some of the students asked about the editing process of the ordering and how that went so that you said that Cameron, when Cameron's came in, it was clear that had to start. But you wanna talk a little bit about some of the process of how you edited it all together um, and who, how that worked and. Yeah, I mean, there was um, a, a Zoom call that, I did with, with Dave and Jennifer, and then our, our new curatorial assistant, Layla Munchnik Benali. And Layla started after all of Syntrax was very much going on. Well, she started right before COVID hit, um, but has been crucial to the implementation of the project. Um, you know, after the kind of conceptual stage. So Layla was on the call too. And, we just each had our own in our own houses a set of post-it notes with each of the filmmakers names written on it and we were just kind of laying out tossing out ideas of what films might bounce off each other or you know kind of echo in certain ways it was it was much more harmonious than I expected um <laughs> and it, it's it's one of those, yeah, it's, I, I love collaborating because I had ideas going into it and I don't know, I just kind of thought, oh yeah, everybody's going to think that Gabriel Mascaro, who he made the piece in like the, the drive-in um, parking garage movie that um, turns into this like um, rage against the machine. <laughs> anti-surveillance um, film, but uh, that is such a strong ending. And I was like, oh, this is clearly where we have to end the series. Like this is the last film in the series, but um, Jennifer was talking about how um, Beatriz Santiago Munoz, her, her film, which was about starting making a film with her family and you know, it's very much in the spirit of, of Cinetrax and going out and making work during this time. And you're you know, creating your communities and your bubbles. And um, there was a way, there was a way that Gabrielle's film is kind of about like a death of cinema. And I think when we were putting this together, it was a moment when 
we all needed a little gentleness and we didn't want to end on such an aggressive ending. Um, we wanted something more hopeful. And so this is kind of about um, an invention of, a, of cinema, um, an invention, invention of art making. Um, yeah, the film, um, uh, A, all of, so I have it up, the, it all is in the same location with a, a friend, um, a, a child who lives nearby, uh, but it's the, the um, titles all narrate the process of uh, starting to make this and that the sound recordist is her son and that, and this is the last title of the film. Um, this, you know, that they're, A, they're secretly making this film even though they're in lockdown in Puerto Rico. And then this is the last film in the, the last title and the character is that young girl who's the next door neighbor um, is Malvina. And this just is the beginning of a film really is what it is. Um, yeah. At the same time that it is an entire film. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I, I agree, I feel like it's a, an ending that really opens up and um, yeah. I, I don't know if I would have chosen it, but. <laughs> but yeah, it really that's one of the things with collaboration, like you feel like, oh, it's inevitable that this like aggressive, like, you know, fight the power ending. And there's a time when we need more voices of gentleness <laughs> in the world. Yeah. And I also love that the ending is, what's the name of this film, right? Yeah. Like, it's what's the, the how do you name a film made of, 19 artists working together that you, um, and working across from each other. And I, I know you said that some of them collaborated or at least shared their videos with each other, but um, you all- I the only two filmmakers who were already friends before this, uh, Christopher Harris and Kelly Gallagher, they, well, Kelly finished hers really early. So she showed it to Christopher and that gave him pressure to finish his. Um, but I think everybody else worked in isolation and everybody said that knowing there were these filmmakers out there like across the globe also working on this like made them feel like they needed to step up and they were eager to see what everybody else was doing but they like they didn't want to make the one that everybody was like oh they were all good except for that one. <laughs> Well, maybe this is a good time to open it up to students and uh, to ask some questions. There are a lot of great questions posed in uh, online prior to uh, your talk, but I wanted to open it up to people, anyone, students or not, to ask questions. And um, uh, you can raise your hand and unmute, and we'll call on you and unmute you, or you can put questions in chat. Um, yeah. So questions for Chris about curating, about this project, about what it's like to be a curator curating during COVID <laughs> um, and how different that is. Uh, Right now we have one that says from Kiana, which is, uh, what's your biggest goal as a curator? Yeah. Um, I know um, plenty of artists who are wary of curators, um, especially in the visual arts world where it's maybe a curator imposing their ideas on your artwork and, um, putting it in a context or an exhibition that changes your work um, in ways the artist, I, I wanna be an advocate for artists. I try to share enthusiasm. <laughs> and so, I mean, in some ways, a lot of what I do is just sharing things I love with other people. Um, but uh, I mean, yeah, at the Wexner Center, there are chances to support an artist and um, really be engaged in, in process. Process is so interesting. I, 
I just find artists so in, I know I'm not an artist, but I find artists interesting and talking with them interesting. And um, I find the process of how work gets made to be one of my biggest interests. So, and there's chances where you can kind of help convey that to an audience, or, or an audience um, um, to, to make the work alive and not just a static thing that, uh, you know, it'll live forever as what it is, but if you can kind of activate it in that way, or even talk about the works that could have been, but didn't become and the choices, whether intentional or accidental that led to that. And um, yeah, so to, to, to bring out some of those things often in conversations with, with artists. Um, but yeah, having, having a place that's not just a movie theater, but also a post-production studio um, really allows for that. Cause there's plenty of places that are one or the other, but there aren't many places that kind of can support and present work in that way. We've got um, some, yeah, you wanna do it, Cortland, I'll let you. <laughs> Either way. Um, yeah, a couple more questions in the chat. Um, gather a couple here. One um, from Jessica is saying, uh, asking if you're planning on doing another Cinetrax project in the future. Um, and then uh, a question from Daniel, um, this sort of asking, did the shorts really come together to form like a distinct specific narrative or message? You know, is that intentional or did that come out in the process or should they still be able to be like understood as independent um, and like kind of singular uh, films? Yeah, I would hope that most of the films can exist on their own. Um, and some of them I think read are more legible if you're familiar with the artist or their other work. Um, so some of them might even exist better in that context. Um, yeah, there wasn't a desire to have a singular work. I think we wanted a diversity of perspectives and forms and modes of, of work working, um, but there were phases throughout this. Like initially, I think when we were first coming up with this idea, we were worried that they were just all going to be films about like whatever elections were happening around the world in 2020. And then there was a moment where it's like, oh, everybody's clearly just going to be making films about, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests because that, you know, took place on a global scale um, as Bushra's film that um, ties into that a little healthcare and um, Black Lives Matters protests in Paris. And um, then there was a moment when everybody, we, we all worried it was just all going to be COVID films. Um, luckily, like, I mean, there's a little bit of everything and it, there was some moment where we realized like, this is a hell of a year we're living through and this might end up being this fascinating document about what artists were thinking of during one of the most notable times of our lives. Um, so yeah, I, I think we got super lucky <laughs> in that sense that it, it could have been so monotonous um, some other time. Um, yeah, but there's just so many sources of anxiety right now. <laughs> Yeah. Let's see. We have a lot, a lot of questions coming in in the chat. So, so if, anyone, if anyone who's put a question in the chat wants to raise their hand um, and uh, to speak to to actually say your question, that would be great. Um, uh, yeah, it looks like um, Sean. Do you want to unmute and go? Hello. Full hand. Yeah. Uh, sorry, my lighting's a little bad, but. Uh, um... Yeah, my question was, um, how has COVID affected your way of going about making projects related to the process of your pre-production, production, and post-production? And has it declined the amount of like artists, filmmakers, projects in a negative? And what were the positives that came out of COVID 
like were there any positive like were there any um did it open doors to learning new things yeah we're still doing residencies um with filmmakers but they're happening remotely and you know usually it's a filmmaker sitting side by side with an editor or doing color correction or sound mix or or whatever, and there's that rapport and shorthand that develops. And now it's all happening sometimes without ever, having ever met in person. So it's a lot more cumbersome and things go much slower. Um, and I mean, it's just hard for everybody to function at normal capacities right now. Um, both in terms of the Wexner Center staff and the artists. Um, so I think things are much more delayed and drawn out. Um, we've still been able to find ways to present work. We're regularly presenting a lot of work online and building um, conversations or supplemental materials around things that online presentations allow for. Um, there's, there's one work um, that we produced about six years ago called Cincinnati Goddamn about the history of um, police inflicted murders of black men in Cincinnati, um, which is a city that has a one of the worst histories of that in the country. Um, and we had worked with the filmmaker of that for nine years to make that documentary about five or six years ago. And there have been a number of shootings in Columbus. Uh, there, Columbus actually has the highest rate of police murders in the country. Um, so we've been able to get that film to so many audiences, classrooms. I don't think that film was super well known um, until COVID has hit and we've been able to like put it online and work with the filmmakers to do all sorts of educational events around it. And it's just, you know, I mean, it's a topic everywhere, but in Columbus, um, it's finally starting to be addressed. And so there's ways that film can be, has been brought up in terms of like, um, activist blogs in town or um, even, you know, the daily newspaper covering it in the context of, of some of the police violence that's happening in Columbus. Um, so ways you can kind of like, usually if you're programming in a cinema, your, your lead time is so far out. And so doing things online during COVID, you can be much more responsive. Um, and I mean, one last thing I'll say is um, there's an experimental animator, Lewis Klar, who we've had a long relationship with, and he made a feature film that premiered at a venue in New York, Light Industry, like this great micro cinema in New York in February, just before the lockdown hit. And the film felt, felt dealt very much with, well, it's kind of like a metaphor of capitalism as a virus. And people were first starting to talk about COVID in February when this screened and they're like, wow, you were so prescient. And we worked with Lewis to present it on the Wexner Center's website almost as like a theatrical release. And we, I think we had it online for like two months. It was available globally. And it was a moment where every new film was being released online. So might have been the same week that Trolls 2 came out. And so us releasing this film of Lewis Clars was as valid as Trolls 2 because we they were being released in identical ways. So the New York Times reviewed the film and gave it a critic's pick. And that's something that like, you know, a film screening in Columbus, Ohio would never get reviewed by the New York Times, but because of how things are presented in COVID. It allowed us to um, insert the film into you know, the conversation of what films came out nationally that week in a way that could never happen otherwise. 
seems like a theme that you're coming back to, which is that this, the, the ways in which A, around film and media conversations have been able to be enabled um, uh, through these moments of Zoom, mm -hmm. uh, bringing people together. I know that you said at one point to me that, you know, the, your ability to bring two people who'd never be able to have a conversation to have a conversation about a film online, um, uh, you know, is one of the things that is, you know, A, keeps cinema, media, media artists fed, right? Um, the conversations, but also uh, that is now an opportunity. It's open to more people, right? To different audiences. But other questions, we've got lots of questions. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that I was going to combine about two or three because I think some of them related kind of just to to what you were talking about, you know, the sort of advantages, disadvantages of trying to curate and put things together during, um, during COVID. And um, so there was a question about if there's something that a new project that you're working on right now that you could maybe talk about um, and, and even maybe, you know, um, related to that kind of um, different sort of <laughs> how different sort of techniques and, and restrictions um, that have come about because of COVID have maybe, um, you know, expanded <laughs> your view or, or um, opened up new ways of doing stuff to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's funny because I was there's a few things that have taken up a lot of my time lately, but lately I'm thinking of starting new projects. Um, I was starting to think about things we could show in the Senate, like being really excited about showing things in the cinema and what to do with that and had a couple of things I was really excited about. And then just with how botched the vaccine rollout was, it, it, it was a, it was a setback to realize, oh, we're not showing anything in the theater anytime soon. And it was hard to, to readapt to showing things online again. And it, it's stopped being as satisfying in some ways. There was a, a momentum and energy and novelty to it. And now like everything you're watching is presented that way. Everybody's doing like all of the kind of variations you can do have kind of been worked through and so it's a little demoralizing, but I think I'm starting to think back in on that idea of trying to get authors engaged with other disciplines more. And right before the lockdown, I had invited this writer, Namwali Serpel, who wrote this book, The Old Drift, and I asked her to curate a film series because um, she's also done some super smart writing on film. She has one of the best reviews of Parasite that she wrote, I think, for The Nation. Um, and so she's clearly so smart about film. So she curated a series, Speculative Africa, and she was going to come out for it and do like both a book talk and present this film series. And it was the first thing we, we had to cancel for COVID. But I'm starting to think back on that ways to um, we have authors present or discuss films or be in conversation with filmmakers. Um, and that's something that could maybe happen online. Like so many things are streaming. So like, say like you tell the audience like, oh, this film is on Netflix right now, watch it. And then next Thursday, we're gonna have this author talking with the filmmaker about it or talking with some, you know, almost like a, a book club, but with films <laughs> centered around authors. When we do reopen, I really want to like think, figure out, refine a series of films um, about audiences wow. and that sense of community and gathering and central mm -hmm. to just talking about Barbara Hammer. Barbara Hammer has this film that's so unlike any other film I've ever seen and it's so tied into who she was. It's from, I think she maybe made it from the late 70s through the early 80s. So she's going to screenings of hers in different cities. I think there's like San Francisco, Toronto, Paris, and it's mainly lesbian women coming to the screenings. And so she's just 
going to the audience in line, um, waiting to go to the screening and interviewing them about what she, they think the films might be, or, you know, she's just interviewing the audience there to watch her films. Mm. Um, and yeah, there's, there's some other films like that about that communal aspect of movie going. So um, hopefully it can do something like, oh, and I'm like still like currently obsessed. All I wanna talk about is this like super radical film, The Spook Who Sat By The Door um, from the late seventies that um, was kind of all I was thinking about over the summer when, when all the protests and uprising were happening because it's um, like somebody trying to infiltrate the FBI from within and um, kind of giving militant groups like little how-to guides, how to overthrow um, governmental forces. Um, and watching it, just realize how amazing the soundtrack is and it's by Herbie Hancock. And you look at all the scores that Herbie Hancock did, and it's such a crazy range of films. There's like Death Wish, um, all sorts of 90s comedies. And I think one of the most interesting type of film series that curators are presenting right now are kind of non-auteurist based series. And this is something that would completely decenter the directors in a way and be such a random mix of films. I don't even know it would work as a harmonious body, but um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, doing a Herbie Hancock series <laughs> sounds really fun. <laughs> okay. How about we take uh, one, one or two more? Anyone wanna raise their hand and ask a question? Portland, how about one or two? One, one okay, more. yeah, yeah. I like this um, this question from uh, Victor um, and it's definitely from sort of a filmmaker and artist perspective. So I think it's interesting to get your view, Chris, and in working with artists and kind of, you know, perhaps seeing their struggles from an, an, a perspective and trying to give advice and feedback and these kind of things. Um, so his question is sort of about like, how do you create work when you're facing restrictions, creative restrictions? Um, and, you know, like if you have a sort of vision for the, for the project, how do you sort of circumvent restrictions or perhaps use restrictions to still kind of make your project and, and create what you were <laughs> envisioning from the first? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, most, you know, conversations with artists or filmmakers don't start off from a place of somebody imposing restrictions upon them. <laughs> but I do know so many people who, um, That is, that is something important. There's a film, um, The Five Obstructions by Lars von Trier and Jürgen Leth, where they're two, you know, veteran Danish filmmakers. And I mean, you know, to use language, they just fuck with each other throughout the whole film. <laughs> they, uh, at one point, one of the filmmakers tells the other that how much he hates cartoons. So the other one's like, okay, your next excitement is that you have to make a cartoon. <laughs> I hate cartoons. Um, but that's, and the whole Dogma 95 movement was built on restrictions. That's one of the, in terms of film, one of the prime examples I can think of is using obstacles um, as a generative device. Um, but then there's other filmmakers I can think of. Um, there's this, this um, wonderful filmmaker, Jeannie Leota, who um, I, I don't know if she still does this, but for a while she wanted a different, um, there's so many um, different media available to filmmakers now and ways to, 
to produce a final film. So she wanted to, to make every film use kind of a different production um, production line through it. So one, she might shoot on 16 millimeter and then blow it up to 35. When she was at the Wexner Center one time working on something, this can of 35 millimeter film showed up just unexpectedly. And it was still in the days when people weren't really making movies on their phone, but she shot a video out, um, I think in Nevada at the Lightning Fields, this, this um, land art site. She shot footage there on her phone, um, which is completely contraband because you're not supposed to shoot there, I don't think. So she had to like secretly do it on her phone and she blew it up to 35 millimeter just to see what it looked like. So. There's that way is where like, you know, you can experiment with like moving from digital to film or film to digital and like seeing what comes out of that. And then maybe using what you learned on that to inform the next thing or um, yeah, provide something generative. And I mean, almost every phase of making artwork or media work can be thought through and um, done in unintuitive ways. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Uh, I think that's a great place to end just because also for people not in the class, but people in the class, the this class uh, is going, everybody will be, all the students will be making a Cinetract um, and then we'll in the last week uh, put them all together and screen um, uh, plasma Cinetracks. Uh, at the end of the semester. So, uh, and that'll be a public screening too. Um, but it's great to hear you talking also about how the other people's work inspires, um, you know, uh, thinking about a, your own, you know, that that's what you work. You make, make things from artists work, mm -hmm. right? You put it together and, uh, and that this is an example of a project that came out of respond, asking other artists to respond to both their moment and previous work. Um, and it really is an incredible collection of uh, pieces that I think do really function individually and separately, um, but uh, very powerful at a moment of just capturing 2020, really. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you, Chris. And um, uh, students, you have uh, um, a a um, response due on Friday. And uh, we will see you next week for Stephanie Rothenberg, uh, professor of art in, uh, at University of Buffalo. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Paige. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.